Good morning. We are wrapping up this series called Letters from Prison, where uh, we are discussing the, the book of Philippians, and I like that video because it kind of gives you a, a really good visual of what it was like for Paul in that prison to, to, to have the, uh, the, the world against him, but still have the, the Christian brothers and sisters at, at, in his mind and his heart to, to write this letter. And, and so we've been going through this letter, and um, this morning we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. So Paul's in prison. Uh, if you want to turn there, Paul's in prison, and he's writing this letter of encouragement to a church in Philippi. We got, that's where we get the word Philippians, uh, this church at Philippi, who is going, uh, going through some, some persecution, some suffering for their faith. And so uh, this morning, we're going to zero in on Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 uh, and following there. It's in your outline, but, but more importantly, verses 5 through 7. And we'll have some scriptures on the screen as well, uh, where Paul challenges us to adopt the same attitude that Jesus had. He said Jesus had a life, led a life of, of others first, and he challenges us to do the same. Read with me here, starting in verse 5. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, and he was born as a human being. Let's pray together, then we'll unpack this verse a little bit. God, we do thank you that we can be in your house to worship you this morning. God, we pray that uh, you teach us through your word. You teach us exactly what it means to be uh, an others first kind of person. That you teach us what it means to put our me first attitude behind and, and adopt the attitude that, that Jesus showed throughout his life. And that was to serve others regardless of circumstance. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start out this morning by talking a little bit about my mom, uh, and I realized as I was saying that this morning first service, I, thought, I think the last time I preached, I talked about my mom, but I guess my mom had an impact on my life, so, so we'll talk about her just a little bit more. Uh, but as I read through the scripture this week, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7, I thought, uh, I thought about mom a lot, uh, because mom was an other's first kind of mom. Your mom was probably an other's first kind of mom. Uh, gave up things that, that, that she wanted gave to you. See, my mom was a single mom. I met my, my father later in life. My mom was a single mom. I was an only child. And we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, we, we lived in a small two-bedroom apartment. Not a whole lot of room. We didn't drive nice cars. Uh, there was a time in our, my life that we didn't even have a car. Uh, so we didn't have a whole lot, and she did what she could to provide. But, but my mom, she, she went to work every day about 6 a.m. And, and left me to, uh, on my own, this is before cell phones. She could just take a break at 7 and call me. Hey, get up out of bed. It's time to get ready for school. So I'd set the alarm, get up at seven, go to school and all that. But she'd leave about six o'clock. She'd come home about three. She'd get dinner ready and she'd go to work again. Uh, she worked two or three jobs at a time just to provide for, for us, our small family. And, and I wondered as a, ki as a kid, I wondered, why would you work so much? But as an adult, we know why. We know that it's because even though we didn't have a whole lot of money, she was going to do what she could to make sure I had what I needed. Matter of fact, sometimes I had what I wanted, you know what I mean? Sometimes I get those gifts that I wanted to get for my birthday and, and so on. So uh, she, she sacrificed for the things that our family needed. She put our family first. She put me first. She didn't buy new clothes. She didn't buy new shoes. She didn't buy new, new purses. And like I said, we didn't drive nice cars. She put me first. She was an other's first kind of mom. You have a mom like that, I'm sure. Maybe you are that mom. But not just an other's first kind of mom, she was an other's first kind of person. When I was a kid, probably fifth or sixth grade, uh, I'm from the small town of Henryville, Indiana, and uh, you might know Henryville because the tornadoes of, of, of a few years ago. And, and, but when I was about fifth or sixth grade, uh, Henryville in, encountered a flood. So you may be thinking, not move to Henryville if there's going to be floods and tornadoes all the time. But, but we encountered a flood in about fifth or sixth grade here. And, and I remember I was on this hillside on, on the, right in front of Main Street, which is where the flood was really uh, hit, hit hard. And, and on Main Street was our IGA. We had an IGA too uh, down in Henryville. And uh, best year of my life working at IGA. That was sarcastic. I'm sorry. Um, but we were sitting there on this hill, and I looked down towards the IGA, and I could barely see the tops of the cars in the parking lot. It was the waters had gotten that high. The trucks, you, you know, you could barely see... Uh, the windshield of the truck in the parking lot because the water had gotten that high. And that night, I watched the news coverage of the flood of Henryville, and, and they showed 
um, these people inside the IGA, the workers of, inside the IGA, they were stuck. They were stranded. They couldn't get out, uh, which is a dream come true for them, I'm sure, stuck at IGA for hours while the waters receded. Um, but they couldn't get out. But we're standing on this hillside watching as a boat came up to this two-story house to um, rescue a family out of this house. And as we stood there, I'm standing there with mom and my grandma and some uh, cousins, and, and we were talking to this family that lived next door to that house. And their house was completely underwater. And they had lost everything. Now, I told you, we didn't live very, you know, extravagant. We had a small two-bedroom house. Uh, didn't have a whole lot of stuff in it. Just a couple couches, a TV, maybe some food, depending on how, how great things went that week. But uh, you're looking at me like, I don't feel sorry for you one bit about food. But, <laughs> but she dug into her purse. She took out her keys. And she, she took the, the key off. And she said, it's not much. But if you want to stay at our apartment tonight, feel free. And I thought, we don't have a whole lot, but she just gave up our house, too. And that, was, that struck me. They didn't stay there. They, they had family in the area, and they, but they were very grateful for that. And it just struck me. Mom was, mom was just an other's first kind of mom. She was an other's first kind of person. Jesus lived an other's first life. And here in Philippians chapter 2, Paul challenges us. We got to live that same life. We have to have that same attitude. He says, you must have the same attitude of Jesus. You must make it your life mission to put others first. And Jesus did this all the time. Jesus lived his life like this. If you remember back at Mark chapter 7, we're going to go there as well. Mark chapter 7, uh, Jesus encounters a Gentile woman. Uh, the, it's called the faith of the Gentile woman. And, uh, and if you don't know, in Jesus' day, for the Jews, there was two types of people. There were Jews, and then there was everybody else. They called them Gentiles. And for Gentiles, they didn't think too highly of them. They didn't like them a whole lot. Matter of fact, they didn't think they were even considered, they were considered maybe less than human, which is a bit conceited, a bit arrogant, but that's how it was. As a matter of fact, it wasn't uncommon for the, for the Jewish people to look at the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and refer to them as dogs. And, and maybe you're a dog lover and you're thinking, well, that's perfect. <laughs> you know, dogs are cute and cuddly and they do tricks for treats and and they, they, they're happy to see me when I get home. That's not what they're saying. They're, they're talking about filthy, scavengers, good-for-nothing, nasty dogs. And they would look at the Gentiles, and they would sometimes consider them to be dogs. And so in Mark chapter 7, uh, Jesus breaks this barrier, and he puts the Gentile woman first. The story goes that Jesus... Jesus was uh, traveling from Galilee up to the region of Tyre. Tyre was a, a, a Gentile region, not a whole lot of Jewish people there. And the story says, that Mark says, uh, in Mark chapter 7, he writes that Jesus didn't want anyone to know which house he was staying in. I don't know if this was like vacation time in Tyre for Jesus or if it was like I needed some just me time. I don't know what this was. I don't know why he said that. But he was not looking for anyone to know which house he was staying in. But Mark goes on to say he couldn't keep it a secret. The word got out. When Jesus comes to town, the word gets out, and everybody knows where Jesus is staying. And so this woman hears about where he's staying, and she barges in, and she falls at his feet because she's got a little girl at home who's being possessed by a demon, and, and she's begging him, please help my daughter. So here's Jesus trying to be alone for a little bit. Don't tell anybody where I'm at. But he gets bothered anyway trying to get away, and, and, and he finds himself in a situation that we might feel like, we might feel a little bit bugged about, you know? We're trying to get away and get to ourselves, and, and all of a sudden, here comes people. I, I, I was talking this, this morning, I said, it's kind of like this week, I was getting my sermon ready, so I grabbed my laptop, and I grabbed my, my, my Bible, and my, my notepad, and my Coke Zero, and I went to the church library conference room, and I got, got, finally got some traction, and wouldn't you know it, Rob Ratliff comes in. Like, come on, Rob, I'm trying, I'm trying to do some work here. And then Rob leaves, and all right, here we go. Finally gets some traction, and in comes Troy Guthrie. I'm like, come on, Troy, I'm trying to get some work done here. And then I get, you know, he leaves, and then in comes my wife. And I'm not too ha unhappy to see my wife. She's the prettiest of all three of them. But, but I was, <laughs> but you kind of give up at that point and say, I'm done for the day. <laughs> you know? No, I don't care that they came in. I really don't. I mean, I'm just teasing about that. But, but here's Jesus. He might, he might have been one in this time. He says, I don't want anyone to know which house I'm staying in, but of all people, in comes a Gentile woman to a, to a Jewish rabbi. Now, we all see him as Jesus, and Jesus is probably with open arms and come on in, but 
But that's not what he, he had said, I don't want really anyone to know where I'm at. But a word got out. He might have been a little bit bothered, we don't know, but let's pick it up in verse 27 of Mark chapter 7. It says, since she was a Gentile, Jesus talked to her a little bit differently. He said this, first, I should feed my own children, my own family, the Jews. He said, in other words, I came for the Jewish people. I came for the Jewish people, and let's remind you here, but you're not a Jew. Now, that might seem a little bit harsh. Let's read on. He says, it isn't right, he goes on to say, it's not right to take food from the children. It's not right to take my time away from the Jewish people and throw it to the dogs, to the Gentiles. Now, before you start losing your faith and compassion, the compassionate life of Jesus here, because you think, Jesus doesn't look too nice here, you know? Jesus is kind of being a, uh, a little bit rude to this woman. He was really, he, what he was trying to do here, he was trying to see just how deep does this woman's faith go? Because obviously she had some faith. She came to him as a Gentile woman come to a Jewish uh, teacher. She came to him. She had some faith. But Jesus is wondering, uh, how, how far does this go? And here he replies... Uh, to her, she might have felt treated the same way every Jewish man's ever treated her, every Jewish person's ever treated her. You're beneath me. You're not good enough for my time. He says, he says I, it isn't right to take food from the children. It's not right to take food from the Jews and throw it to the dogs, to the Gentiles. But her response is fantastic. She says, that's true, Lord. But even the dogs, even the dogs under the table are allowed to eat the scraps from the children's plates. She says, even us, even us, we deserve some of that mercy. We deserve some of that goodness. We deserve some of that grace. We deserve, we deserve some of that healing. And Jesus got exactly what he was looking for here. Look at this, the, the end of the, the verse here. It says, good answer. Now go home. The demons left your daughter. Jesus might have been a little bit bothered here when, when he didn't want anyone to know where he was or uh, which house he was staying in, and then comes this woman. And, uh, but remember what he did first, he points out the, what the culture says. The culture that they lived in says it's us first, Jews first, me first. He said, first, I should feed the children, my own family, the Jews. That's the way the world works, Jews first. But by the end of their time together, you see what he does. He rewards the faith of the non-Jew, and he says... You first. You first. Your daughter's healed. Jesus lived another's first life. He turned things upside down. He took the culture and said, this isn't correct. Let's live this way. And again, in, Paul, and in Philippians, Paul, in chains, in prison, Paul writes this, you must have the same attitude. You must have the same attitude that Jesus had. Though he was God, he didn't consider that uh, equality with God as something to, to hold on to. Instead, he gave up his, his divine privileges. He made himself nothing. He poured himself out. He took the humble position of a slave. And what did he do? He put the Gentile woman first. And, and, and he washed his disciples' feet, those who were there to serve him. And, and he healed the sick. And he touched the lepers, those who people didn't even go near and he loved the people that people just forgot about. Over and over throughout the New Testament, we see Jesus putting others first. And in Philippians, Paul says, you got to have that same attitude. you got to put others first. So the question that we have this morning for us, Jesus put others first. Do we? Do we put others first? Do we live a life? Are we an others first kind of person? Though I might be important or I might have... Uh, social standing, or I might uh, have, have uh, all these people who look up to me, are you willing to throw that away for the benefit of those around you? Are you willing to give up yourself in order to benefit those who serve you? Are you willing to, to make yourself nothing to benefit those who the world has just forgotten about? Paul says you've got to have the same attitude. Are we willing to make ourselves nothing in order to serve anyone, everyone, regardless of how important they might be or how unimportant they might be, are we willing to adopt the same attitude that Jesus had? Paul's not just suggesting it here. Look at his language. He says, you must have the same attitude as Jesus. You've got to. 
If you're going to call yourself a Christian, you've got to look like Christ. A little farther into his letter, Paul says, if there's anyone that has the right to say this, it's me because I had it all and I gave it all. I gave myself to become more like Christ. He tells them basically, if you think you're too important to to stoop as low as to give up your social status or your, your, your position, take a look at who I used to be. Philippians chapter three, he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. That's a strict Jewish custom. That's check. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. Check, I was important. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand, uh, who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. Check. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church and, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He was writing to this church, he said, I was impressive. I was awesome. But he goes on to say, I once thought that these things were so valuable. I thought these things were it. I thought this is what life was about. But now I consider them worthless because of Christ. For his sake, I have discarded all of it, counting it as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Translation, he's saying, I was important. I was pretty awesome. I had it all. I was the man, and I gave it all because I wanted to have the attitude of Jesus. And if I can do that, you can do that. We've got to put ourselves aside. Paul challenges us to the life that Jesus called us to, the life that Jesus modeled for us, and that's a life of of putting other people first. So in the time we have left this morning, I just want to go through these three points on your your outline there, if you want to pull that out and and grab a pen, and you might be a little bit uh, nervous for the fact that I'm just getting to the first point. Uh, it's okay, we're going to go pretty quick through these, but if you want to get your outline, we're going to talk about, uh, we, we have a choice to make, and every day uh, we have to be putting others first, we have to adopt that same attitude as Jesus, and in your outline, we're just going to write three ways, three areas that Jesus calls us to put others first, that Paul's challenging us to adopt the same attitude of Jesus. So number one, if you got a pen, you got your outline ready, write this down. Make the choice, you got to make the choice, I choose to put others first in my church. Now, full disclosure here, I wrote this outline last week, okay? Uh, I sent this in on Saturday because I thought I was going to be gone a couple days this week and um, to a canoe trip that got rained out because there's too much water in the river, all that. So I got this outline done early, but this point took on new meaning this week for, uh, for me, uh, putting others first in my church. And I wasn't going to go this direction, but I felt led to anyway. A few minutes ago, Dave came up and he, he stood up here and made a tough announcement about a tough decision uh, that was made by the elders this week. And, and, you know, I've talked to several of you in person, through email, on the phone, and, and there's questions, there's why, what happened, or, or I don't understand, or I'm, I'm upset, or I get all those, I really do, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this this morning, but, but I want to share an email that I received on Tuesday afternoon, just a few hours after... Uh, the initial email went out. I received this email and I put it up on the screen for you. It says this. So I'm trying to process this information. I didn't see that one coming. But I just want to let you know that if there's anything I can do to help with administrative or children's ministry stuff, please let me know. Man, I thought that was, that's exactly what this week is all about. That's exactly what this message is all about. It's about, I don't understand. I'm a little bit shocked. I don't get it. But what can I do to put my church before me? And that humbled me. That email humbled me. And I emailed this person back and told him exactly that. That's an others first attitude. Our church, every church, every church in America, every church in the world needs each other to put the mission of the church ahead of our own desires. We need to put the mission of the church first. And, 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 you know, this email mentioned children's ministry, but maybe you're not a children's ministry kind of person. Maybe you're, you know, I can swing a hammer, or I can, I can uh, fix a pipe, I can do whatever, I can use my handyman skills to make sure the church is, is looking nice. And maybe that's your ministry, or maybe you want to invest in some time into our teenagers, or maybe, uh, maybe you feel led to, to serve on a worship team, or maybe you have some great computer knowledge and computer skills that you want to serve the church through that. Uh, in, this, in this age of technology, you want to help out the church become uh, relevant in the, in the tech world. You, you know, uh, maybe you want to just uh, 
be a prayer warrior for all the ministries at ECC. But the bottom line is that God has called us to put others first in our church. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a great chapter of scripture. And I encourage you to, I was going to read the whole chapter this morning, but that put us out about a little after one, I guess, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, But I encourage you to read that entire chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, And what it speaks to all of us is that, that our church is nothing without each and every one of us engaging and being involved in the ministry of the kingdom uh, right here in Ellensville. Our church will not begin to see the impact that we can have on the kingdom of God until we live out 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 starts out and Paul's talking about all of the different spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit will, will give to us. And then he moves on into verse 12 and he says this, the human body has many parts but the many parts make up one whole body. And so it is with the body of Christ. Yeah, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. Verse 25 says, this makes for harmony among the members so that all members care for each other. Verse 27, all of you together are Christ's body. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it which means each of you has responsibility to it. Like I said, our church, any church, we're not gonna begin to see the impact we can have on the kingdom until we can live this scripture out. So we've gotta make the choice to put others first in our church. Number two in your outline there, you gotta make this choice. I choose to put others first in my home. Uh, Last year, the Huffington Post uh, put this article online and it was right around Mother's Day and it's called 10 Things Your Mom Never Told You. So moms, this might uh, hit home a little bit. I'm not going to read all 10, but uh, it said things like, you made her cry a lot. And you might have. And moms are sitting there, yeah, (laughs) they made me cry a lot. It says things like, she was afraid sometimes. It says, she really did want that last piece of pie. But she gave it to you anyway. But number nine says this. It says, she put you first. It reads, she went without food, without showers, without sleep. She always put your needs before her own. She would spend all day meeting your needs. You guys hearing this? All day meeting your needs. And by the end of the day, she would have no energy left for herself. But the next day, she'd wake up and she'd do it all over again because you meant that much to her. Kind of an awe moment, I guess, right? You can all say it, awe. But that's what moms do. That's what dads do. That's what marriages are supposed to look like. Putting each other first, hoping that they're gonna put you first in return. Spending all day meeting each other's needs, put each other's needs before our own, get up and do it all again tomorrow. Moms do it, most of the time moms do it, most of the time dads do it, sometimes spouses do it. But what if we all did it? What if we all did that? Think about those in your house. I want you to think about everyone that lives in your house right now. Every single person that lives in your house. This is really important for you guys here. Brothers, sisters, mom, dad, kids. Anyone that lives in your house as I read this scripture here in Philippians chapter two, right before Paul challenges us to have the same attitude as Jesus, here's what he says. Think about your family here. Think about who lives in your house. He says this, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Think of others as better than yourselves. Did you catch that? Were you thinking about mom or dad or your kids or brother or sister down the hall? Think of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Friday night at the house, we were doing a housewide clean which I've heard is, is really different. I mean, it's kind of the equivalent of trying to, uh, when you have kids, doing a housewide clean is kind of the equivalent of brushing your teeth while eating Oreos. 
You ever heard that? It's really true. I mean, you can clean it and then you turn around and there it is. I was sent to the store, which I'm gladly a volunteer to go to the store when it's housewide clean time. But uh, I, I spoke to my oldest, seven-year-old Lawton, and I said, do whatever your mom asks. In fact, do more than she asks. And I thought, that's good. That's like, that's like Twitter good. I'll, I'll throw that out there on Twitter maybe. <laughs> but then he looked up at me like instantly and says, as a seven-year-old would, how am I supposed to do more than she asks? What does that even mean? And so I had to explain to him, well, maybe you do this. She didn't ask you to do this, do this. That's what, I, that's, that's what you know, putting others first in our house looks like. That's what putting others at, uh, first is to do the things that you're not asked to do. Husbands, it's not about us. I thought I'd hear a couple of amens from the women there. <laughs> it's not about us, it's about serving our brides. Women, it's not about uh, you, it's about serving your husbands. Kids, it's not about you, it's about serving your parents and serving your brother and serving your sister. It's about a house serving each other. So we gotta make the choice to choose to put others first as Jesus did in our home. And then third, we need to make the choice to choose to put others first in, in my community. And now I'm excited about next Sunday. Uh, just again, 10.30, we're having a service down here at the park with the place, another church here in town. And uh, it's gonna be a great service, but then in the afternoon, we get to take another uh, big step towards serving those in our community, to, to putting others first putting those in our community before ourselves. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we have this here, we have backpack giveaway. We're giving away, I don't know, something like 150 plus backpacks with school supplies. We'll give away um, food, we'll feed the community, we'll, feed, we'll put clothes on their back if they, if they need some clothes. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll just hang out with them and, and engage them one-on-one. It's a good step towards, towards uh, engaging our community and putting them first, but that's just one day. It's a great step and I'm really excited about that. I can't wait. But that's just one day. And really, it's just a couple of hours of one day. So what I'm talking about of putting ourselves first, putting others first in your community, I'm talking about holding the doors for strangers. I'm talking about loving those that you come into contact with on a daily basis, seeing a need that needs met and meeting it in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about um, see, seeing, seeing a mom in need, seeing a mom struggling to, to get the food to the table while kids are pulling on her and helping her out. Put others before yourself in your community. Paul said we have to have the same attitude as Jesus. He said, you must have the same attitude of Jesus. And Jesus taught us to do this. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter uh, 25, Jesus is talking about on that day when he returns, and he says he's going to have some to the left, he's going to have some to the right. And he says to the right, he says, for I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And they said, well, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we come visit you in prison? They don't remember any of this. He says, whatever you did for anyone that was in need, you did it for me. So if you're unsure how to put others first in your community, Jesus starts a good list right here. He says, feed the hungry. Make new friends and be hospitable to them. You know, love people. Meet physical needs of, of others, you know, whether it be food, uh, water, clothing, shelter, whatever it is. Meet the needs of people and do it in the name of Jesus. And help care for the sick. Encourage them by getting in there and helping them do the things that they just can't do anymore, or at least for right now. And how about this one? Sure to make all of us a little bit uncomfortable. Visit the prisoners. He says it. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty. You gave me a drink. I was a stranger. You invited me into your home. I was naked. You gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. So we got to make the choice. We, we've got to choose to put others first in my church. We have to choose to put others first in my home and in my community. And, and Paul isn't just suggesting this as this would be a good idea, guys. This is, this is him saying it, uh, you must have the same attitude. You must have the same attitude as Jesus. Don't consider yourself better than others. Pour yourself out. Make yourself nothing. Put others first. So this week and in the the upcoming weeks, uh, I I like, Troy likes to use hashtags, and and, uh, I enjoy that. Uh, I was in our small group, and someone said this week, I don't even know how to use a hashtag. And that might be true of you. So let me explain real quick. Uh, As you go, it would be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is, and you just tag that little, it's a pound sign. It's what it is. Uh, you, they, what's a pound sign? I don't get that. Uh, you put a pound sign and then the word that we, we're, we're using here. 
and you hit search, and it'll pull up all the posts that have used that certain hashtag. And you can read the, the stories uh, of hashtag letters from prison or hashtag others first. And what I want you to share uh, this week and the upcoming weeks is when you see someone doing this, when you see someone living this out, snap a picture, post a story, use hashtag others first, and let's, let's be encouraged by that. Let's be challenged by these, by these over the next few weeks. And, um, and days. So use that hashtag. And if, uh, and if you don't know how that works, ask a teenager. They'll help you out. And, and, uh, and just encourage us by, by sharing that with us, okay? As we close out this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to do something just a little bit different. Uh, we did it last week. We're going to give you the chance to put others first right now. Uh, like I said, we have this free backpack giveaway next week for the community. And, and uh, we, we took up some offering last week. And we're going to do it again this week as you walk out the doors here in a little bit. And there's going to be some really cute kids with shameless frowns or smiles, depending on the kid, with their backpacks open, waiting for you to, to put some money in. They're not going to keep a percentage of that or anything, but what we do is we take all that money and we're just going to go shopping. We're going to go shopping for, for school supplies uh, and we're going to give all that away next week. Um, so I, I want to encourage you to put others first. Uh, and, and you have the chance to do that uh, right now. So, uh, so again, we're going to watch this video. It's kind of a, a recap of what, what happened last year, and, and then we'll be dismissed, um, and, and you'll have a chance to put others first right now. Let me pray for you. God, I do pray that we can put others first. God, it's so hard because we are a me first. Uh, we're humans. We're a me first society. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're always thinking about ourselves. But God, as Paul said right here in Philippians, and uh, in his letter from prison, he said, don't think of others, uh, or think of others as better than yourselves. Don't uh, think of just your, your own interest, but think of other interest people, uh, people's interests as well. So we pray that we can become those people because it's, it's difficult to put ourselves aside. We pray that uh, if there's anyone here this morning that wants to uh, sit, stand, kneel, go to the prayer room, come forward, talk to an elder, talk to a staff member, and just pray that, that, that you will take their me-first attitude. We pray that that happens, God. We pray that you do take those, those me-first attitudes away from us. And again, help us to adopt that others-first mentality. In Jesus' name, amen.